want to take this to Islamic finance, right? And you've, you've made this point, you know, a few times about the fact that the balance sheets of the Sharia finance, uh, Sharia banks, uh, have basically interest-bearing nature on both the asset side and the liability side of the game. And Bitcoin could be the answer in basically, you know, making it more Reba-centric. Uh, talk, talk about that. How, how Bitcoin basically will dovetail a lot more with uh, the pure, you know, intentions of Islamic finance. Yeah, so one thing that I came, uh, one conclusion that I came to from writing the fiat standard is that the global fiat monetary system of the last century has been effectively like a tax on Muslims. It's like a tax on being a Muslim. Um, and it's just uh, baked into the way that the system works in a way that you can't, uh, you can't opt out of as a Muslim. You, you can't just say, all right, I don't want to play this game and I don't want to be um, uh, hurt by it. So, and the reason for that is that, um, I, you know, looking at fiat, looking at the fiat monetary system as a software, almost thinking about how the process works. Uh, the key insight is how does fiat get created? How does fiat money get created? And the answer is that fiat money, as I was saying earlier, you know, once you've centralized the money, then it became the credit of the government. Basically, fiat means that um, the government's credit is money. So the government's credit is as good as gold in a fiat monetary system, which means that every time the government issues credit, the money supply increases, which also means that anytime an, a financial institution that's backed by um, the government and guaranteed by the government, anytime one of these uh, institutions issues credit, then the money supply increases. In other words, the, what I call it in, in, in the fiat standard is fiat mining. Borrowing, lending is like mining. You know, in Bitcoin, you have the proof of work as a way of producing uh, Bitcoin, which ensures that it's always expensive to make Bitcoin. Nobody can make Bitcoin for free. With gold, you need to dig into the ground and take soil out and process it in order to make gold. But with, um, with, uh, with fiat, the way that you mine fiat into existence is through credit. And many people think that government money is papers and you just print uh, money and then uh, that's how it comes into existence. And that's not true. The money comes into existence when credit is created and then some of that already existing money is printed as uh, physical bills. So the money is digital, you know, fiat is a digital currency and it's created every right. time a loan is made. So this means that anytime you create a loan or you take out a loan, you're devaluing everybody else's money. So therefore banks are inflationary and banks benefit from inflation. And so if you go to a bank and you borrow a million dollars in order to start a business, let's say, they're not taking a million dollars from their own capital or from their customers and giving them to you. They make a new $1 million. So right. for them, that's why they really want you to borrow. That's why banks really, 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 really want you to borrow all over the world. And because every time you borrow from them, they make new money. So they are able to devalue everybody else's money by bringing new money into supply. And that's why it's much cheaper for you to buy your house with a loan than it is to buy it with cash. Because if you save money to get to the to buy the house, you're saving money that is declining in value. So the house keeps getting more expensive and your savings keep becoming uh, less valuable. Whereas if you borrow, then you're letting the inflation work in your favor. The new money is generated. You've devalued everybody else's money to make let your bank make these new $1 million that they're going to get paid back in inter with interest. And because you're letting your bank do this very sweet deal, the bank is obviously going to cut you in on the deal because they want you to do that. So, you know, they're not going to take it all to themselves. They're going to make it a lot sweeter for you to buy the house or start the business on credit than it is for you to do it with savings. So that's why if you have a million dollars, you don't start a business with a million dollars. You use it to borrow $10 million so that you can start a business that's worth $10 million. So what this means is that basically if you engage in riba, you are mining money, you're printing money. It's like mining gold. And so if your religion tells you you should not get into riba, then you've locked yourself out of a money creation and you know you're and if you're but of course you still have to use the money right so if you're a muslim and you don't want to take loans and you decide that you want to save money 
because you don't believe in riba, you are holding the money that is being devalued in order to finance everybody else's riba. So in other words, whether you take part in riba or not yourself, you are taking part in it because it's baked into the fiat protocol <laughs> at the protocol level. The only way that fiat money comes into existence is through riba. And this is true in the US, in Europe, it's true in uh, Islamic countries, it's true everywhere. The, the, the global financial system is built around this idea that money gets generated from debt. So you can't escape it if you're using the government's money. Uh, th there's just no way around it. The only question is, will you benefit from it or will you get hurt by it? And even if you benefit from it, obviously, you're not going to very easily benefit because like, um, you know, you borrow and then you're at risk and then you could lose your house. And like, it's, it's not like it's all um, rainbows and roses if you just get into riba. Um, but it is, um, there is a possibility that you could come out ahead with riba. Without riba, you're basically, um, uh, you're just financing everybody else getting into riba. And so, up until I, re I wrote the Bitcoin standard and I thought about this very hard, I hadn't really considered this in this way. But, you know, when you look at it, like around the world today, the majority of Muslim scholars, particularly the ones that are related, you know, the ones that are approved by governments, have in one way or the other found a way to basically get around this. Just and like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a religious scholar and I can... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to pass judgment whether that's okay or not. I can sort of see the case for why you might uh, want to say that something like this is okay. Like after writing the fiat standard, I can understand why um, uh, you, you, uh, as, uh, as a religious authority, you, you know, you see how much people are getting hurt by inflation when they hold savings and you see how much more expensive it is for them to get a house. And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not passing a religious judgment here, but I can see where the uh, case for allowing people to engage in this is because essentially we're in a world in which there's, um, there's you could argue perhaps there is no alternative to it. Um, wow. And, you know, there are, there are kind of s similar justifications. Like, you know, if somebody puts a gun to your head and tells you, um, I will shoot you unless you uh, drink alcohol, I believe it would be permissible. <laughs> Um, so it, you could see it as you could make the case for it in that way before Bitcoin. But now that we have Bitcoin, I don't believe that that case can hold up anymore because right now we do have an instrument that as a Muslim, you can use as money that is free from riba and that also can perform all the functions of money. So historically, you know, a lot of Muslims have tried to revive the Islamic dinar and there are a lot of initiatives around the world built around let's bring back the Islamic dinar. And uh, uh, I think there's one in Indonesia that's quite uh, popular. I'm not, I'm not sure. I've, I've read about it many years ago. Um, so many Muslims want to work on reinstating the Islamic dinar. And I think it's, it's a noble uh, cause. But uh, again, the problem is you can't just have an international system for settlement and clearance of gold. And so therefore, you know, what ends up happening is, all right, you're a Muslim, you want to stay out of the riba system. But let's say you run a business in Indonesia and you have suppliers in China and you have customers in the US and you have customers in Europe and you want to get paid from the Europeans and the Americans and you want to pay your Chinese suppliers, your gold is not going to work for that. So what ends up happening is that you have part of your portfolio, part of your cash balance in gold, part of it in uh, uh, your local fiat, part of it in dollars, part of it in um, yuans. Yeah. Well, before Bitcoin. Uh, so you had to diversify between all of those different things and you had no choice but to deal with your local riba bank. You know, you had no choice. You had no way of dealing. With, if, if you wanted to buy things from abroad and send things abroad, you had no choice but to get paid through your local fiat riba bank. Well, now with Bitcoin, you do have an alternative. And it's an alternative that does all of the things that your bank does and it does all the things that your gold does and it does them all better. So nobody can inflate it. Nobody can devalue it and take the supply that you have. And nobody can uh, take the money away from you without your permission. And nobody can put riba in it. Nobody can force you to engage in riba like you do with the other forms of money. And so because of all of that, I think it's, um, I, th I think there's a huge potential for the Muslim world oh, yeah. to 
in Bitcoin adoption because if you know if you if you don't want to take part in riba you have the alternative right now and i can obviously i understand that you know bitcoin's volatility is not for everybody so I, you know uh, uh, and i'm not telling everybody to go and sell everything and buy bitcoin straight away you know there could be a big crash in the future but i think you should get into it responsibly slowly as you learn how right. it works and you know um particularly you know as a business if you have you know if you're a business and you're you're running your accounts with the local currency you have right. liabilities and assets and you have um, inflows and outflows denominated in the currency you can't just switch everything to bitcoin but you can begin to build a cash balance in bitcoin sure. and then um you know accumulate and wait on that cash balance for a few years as it appreciates I imagine you know you'll be in a better position, so then then you can fully transition out of the riba system. I'm with you. I'm with you. 